Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media and the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment, let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III, joined by Double Trouble. <laughs> Mr. Jeff Reed is on my left. Mr. Bobby. Bobby Rosa. Bobby Rosa. I got to put the R in there. Let me put some respect on your name, Bobby. Is on my right, and I am uh, excited to be here with you for a new day, another edition of the program here on February 9th, 2021, in the year of our Lord, 2021. So much is happening, but still, the truth is, what goes on in your house is far more important than what is happening in the White House or in the Senate chambers or in the wacky House of Representatives, or in the Supreme Court, or in the Ninth Circus, or you name it. What goes on in your house is far more important. Why is that? Because the first institution that got created before there was a monarchy, a civil government, or even an ecclesiastical body known as the church. The first institution that got created was the family. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage, nay, implore you to serve your families with a ministerial commitment to where you recognize that this is one of uh, the primary opportunities that God has given you to honor him in and through. Serving your families is ministry. Cultivating your, your relationship with your spouse and cultivating your spouse is ministry. The world wants us to place import on everything else. But by and large, if, if we would look at, and I've, I've said this before, the enlargement of the Leviathan state, it parallels with the retrenchments that have taken place within families. Simply put, the more families contract, the more government wants to do. <laughs> Who needs a daddy? I'll be your daddy. What's your name? Uncle Sam. And pass me my green eggs and ham. But may that not be said among uh, the body of Christ. It may not be said among Hamilton Corner listeners uh, because you literally have the opportunity to glorify God, to worship him, to execute his commission. And as a result of doing that, you have the opportunity to change the world by serving your families well, being diligent in your commitment uh, to preach the word of God to your family, to read the word of God to your family, to, to uh, praying together with your family by exalting and elevating Christ in your home. Brothers and sisters, the, the corporate worship gathering should not be the primary place where our families learn to worship the Lord. It should happen around our table in our home. And I want to encourage you, as I said before, to recognize that what goes on in your house is far more important than what happens in the White House. Praise God. We're going to start today in Malachi, Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2. We're going to focus on just two verses in this chapter, Malachi, well, it's three verses. <laughs> Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Now, I want to explain something before we dig into it, a little bit of context for uh, Malachi's writings. I've said before that the, the description of major prophets and minor prophets, it has nothing to do with the significance of what they prepared, what they've written by the Spirit of God, what the Spirit of God has written through them, I should say. But it only describes the length of their writing. Major prophets, major prophets wrote more, minor prophets wrote less. But all of what they wrote is the Word of God. The next thing I want to point out is that Malachi's writing that is recorded in Scripture for our benefit took place at about 430 B.C. 430 B.C. Why is that significant? Malachi, Haggai, and Zechariah all 
were post-exilic prophets to Judah. Now, what does that mean? These were men that God raised up as prophets to minister to Judah after the Babylonian exile and, the, dare I say, the repatriation back into Israel. You, re, you remember that after the 70 years uh, that God prophesied through Jeremiah and others took place and prophesied through Habakkuk and others, uh, then you have the books of Nehemiah. You know, you have those books where you have Jews returning to Israel and returning to Judah and rebuilding even uh, the temple there. Malachi is one of the prophets after the exile occurred and Jews were sent back to Judah. Uh, God sent, sent uh, Malachi uh, along with Haggai and Zechariah and, and others to minister to them there. Uh, it's amazing that even um, in, the, in the end of the books of, of Ezra and Nehemiah, they talk about how even when they get sent back, when they get back into Israel, they start just doing some of the same sins that led to their exile in the first place. It's amazing. Malachi's major overarching purpose in writing, what the Spirit of God gave him to write, was to confront the people in their sin and to restore, to help restore their relationship with Yahweh. All right. With that as a background backdrop, and that will help to help us to understand that the verses that we read, this is a part of God using Malachi to confront the Jews who'd returned to Judah in their sinfulness, all right? In the middle of this rebuke, Malachi pins these words by the Spirit of God. Mal Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. It says this, verse 13. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit. Let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Now, this is a part of a larger rebuke that is far more detailed than what we read here today. But in the crux, in the core of this uh, extensive rebuke, God directs Malachi to pin a... A, an intrinsic purpose to what we commonly describe as the one flesh union. Verse 15 says it specifically. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. It sounds a lot like what Jesus says in Matthew 19. For this cause shall a man, he made them both male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and join, be joined or cleaver to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh with the portion of the Spirit as a part of their union. In this short verse, the Lord reveals that an intrinsic purpose of the one flesh union is God's desire for godly offspring. Godly offspring. Not just offspring, but godly offspring. If you search the scriptures, and I encourage you to do so, you will find that the instruction to disciple, to catechize, and to instruct our children in the way is not a suggestion. It is, in fact, a command. It is, in fact, a command. I don't want anybody to leave here with the misunderstanding that, oh, well, it's just a good suggestion. You know, Abe talks about, you know, what goes on in your house is more important than what goes on in the White House. And well, it, it would be nice 
if we taught our children the things of God, but that ain't what we really have to do. I just want to let you know, because I don't want anybody who listens to this program to be unaware that one of the things that we'll, we will be evaluated upon when we stand before the Lord, transitioning into the eternal state, or should I say the other side of eternity, is the Lord is going to query us on how we stewarded his heritage. Psalm 127 says, children are the heritage of the Lord. They are not our ownership or possession. We've been given the privilege and opportunity to steward them for a season. One of the things that God is going to investigate or going to query us about is how we stewarded his heritage. All the way in the book of Malachi that we just read, you know, the final book before we enter the intertestamental period, <laughs> which we see in the New Testament is confirmed through Paul in other areas. <laughs> Guys, this is not a suggestion. This is the responsibility that we have. I know that sometimes in many, in many places, many of us, we didn't know that. I've had conversations with people say, Dave, I didn't know that. But I want to make sure everybody who listens to this program understands that intrinsic, from God's perspective, an intrinsic purpose for the one flesh union is God's desire for godly offspring. Now, but hey, there's people, all kinds of things that are happening. You know, I have relatives who have difficulty conceiving and all kinds of things. Yes, because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. But the truth is, is that God, as the sovereign potentate of time, as the scripture unfolds it, it is he who opens and closes the womb. So if you have the privilege of having uh, natural reproduction, the womb is opened for the purpose for godly offspring. Additionally, Biological reproduction isn't the only opportunity for reproduction. I've said before, the, ch the, the, the church by and large, and I don't want to paint with a broad brush because I know there are lots of Christians individually and there are lots of churches corporately that are doing this. You know, I'm a part of a church that's turning in this direction. But by and large, the church needs to match our commitment to pro-life policy advocacy and, and celebration with pro-life activity. We should combine our disdain for in utero baby murder with a, a, a passion to adopt those whom the world, for whatever reason and for whatever circumstance, would discard. Adoption is central to our theological framework. And this is not something that would be novel in our generation. In fact, historically, this is something that the church of God has done all the way back, dating back to the first and second centuries. Understanding the heart of God will reveal in us, or should I say would cause us to realize that God is a multi-generational God. He has always had a mind and a heart and a desire for multiple generations of witnesses, of faithfulness. In fact, in this same uh, book that we're reading, that the book of Malachi closes with his recitation of the hearts of the fathers being turned to the sons and the hearts of the sons being turned to the father. And let me add this into the dialogue because y'all hear me say this all the time. I'm talking to the body of Christ right now. Because the world is going to world. The world is going to do what the world does. But in the body of Christ, there should be, dare I say, a different, peculiar culture. There should be such a culture for multi-generational witness and the celebration of life where it is celebrated and passionately pursued where the body of Christ says, you know what? Before anybody in our city considers having their children slaughtered in utero, utero call us because we have families that have been praying for that child who are eagerly awaiting for that child 
for the opportunity to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's time for there to be a turning of the corner within the family of God in our country. Like no other nation, Americans have lived under the blessing of prosperity and liberty. These gifts are part of the heritage of a country grounded in the truths of Scripture and given by God to advance the gospel at home and abroad. In these days of moral and spiritual confusion, maintaining the freedom to express our faith in the public square has never been more important. The American Family Association, working to preserve religious liberty for generations to come. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Come back to the Hamilton Corner. Excuse me, I had to take a sip of my tea there. Tea is hot. Studio's ready. I'm ready to rock and roll. And let me make sure I'm clear on this. I don't want anybody to, to think uh, I'm saying that nobody in the church is doing anything because I know that's not true. That's not true at all. What I am talking about, there should be a larger push. This should be mainstream Christianity pushing. And this doesn't require us to do anything with laws or legislation or the courts or anything. We simply say, hey, do you realize we have X amount of families here praying for that child? And I've said it before. What'd you say? No, I thought oh. I did. Oh. <laughs> and I've said it before. Churches in our country, we prioritize, let me be specific, financially, we prioritize all kinds of things. We prioritize missions, and I'm a, I'm a, or a 10 billion percent supporter of prioritizing missions, foreign missions, no doubt. But you know what else, you know what else I support? Prioritizing domestic missions. You know, one of the evidences of just how wicked our nation is, in some places it costs tens of thousands of dollars to abort a child. In some cases, 30 plus thousand, I'm sorry, tens of thousands of dollars to adopt a child. And in some cases, upwards of $30,000. You hear what I'm telling you? <laughs> when a, a couple hundred to kill one. And for, for many of us, God has blessed our local assemblies with resources. Man, let's prioritize in saving these children's lives and rescuing their lives physically. Uh, that if God would give us the privilege and opportunity that we may be able to contribute to pouring into their lives spiritually. You want to talk about a witness for the king, a witness for Christ. This we can do, family. This we can do. <sighs> All right. Let me move on. This is not foolishness. Let me, I'm going to start here, and, and I'll, I'll give you all this hint. I'm going to read a poem to you, and I'll tell you this much. This started with a conversation between my wife and I. And my wife said, Abe, you probably should talk about this on the radio. I said, I don't know, babe. I'll think about it. She didn't know I, I had decided to do it. So she might be listening saying, oh, you finally listened to me for a change, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read this. Some of you, when I start reading this, you're going to recognize it. Many of you are not going to recognize it. Here we go. Here's the poem. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, Bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. 
We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. Do you know what that is? <laughs> huh? But you want it. Now, I'm going to tell you guys what this is. As I said, some of you, as I was reading it, you know exactly what it is. Some of you are like, man, I don't know. What is that? This is the poem titled Lift, Lift Every Voice and Sing. This poem was written by James Weldon Johnson, who was a civil rights lawyer. I'm a civil rights activist, a lawyer, and a principal of a school called the Stanton School in Jacksonville, Florida. It is a poem that James Weldon Johnson wrote as a tribute to President Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And it was first recited at the Stanton School in Jacksonville, Florida on February 12th. 1900, the first time it was ever recited publicly, when Booker T. Washington, or say his full name, Booker Talfero Washington, visited the Stanton School in 1900. James Weldon Johnson's brother, John Rosamond Johnson, put the poem to music, which, is, which became the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Now, as a child, I learned this song growing up, but I didn't learn the history growing up. I learned the history as an adult. Now, why am I bringing this up now? Well, we, we had just the, you know, the Super Bowl happened Sunday and um, we didn't have any big plans. Some friends invited us over to watch it. But, but before the, the, the game started in the pre-show part, they had a dramatic presentation where this song was sang. And it caused my wife and I to start having this conversation because some of you may remember back in when all of the various, you know, protests were happening and, and the NFL was having these discussions and the, pre the, the pr proposal was made, well, we're going to sing, lift every voice and sing before the football games. And man, pandemonium broke out. It was like, what? This is such a divisive song. And I remember in the throes of all of that, I just kept posting on social media one thing. Have you read the lyrics? Have you read the lyrics? Have you read the lyrics? Because if you read the lyrics, there's no way you conclude, no way that you can conclude that the song, which is, again, a poem that was set to music, was divisive. What happened, in my opinion, is a microcosm of what is happening in our society today where people are talking past one another and not talking to one another. James Weldon Johnson was a principal of the Stanton School, and he viewed himself and the fact that he, as a more melanated man, can be a principal educating young children who were the descendants of former slaves and former freedmen. He viewed himself as the embodiment of the promise that the United States of America provided. And the, song, the, the poem is actually a Christian poem to where... He literally, and I'm going to go through and explain this from the lyrics, he, where he liter literally is looking back at what has happened in our country and he's preparing for Booker T. Washington to visit. And the whole point of the poem's pinning was to celebrate Abraham Lincoln's birthday. That was the whole point. To celebrate Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And Booker T. Washington, who if you don't know, and, and let me say this. 
Because people talk about black history, folks. Black history in America is American history. And our nation has been disserved because we've had this, this bifurcation to where we don't understand these things. That's why entire segments of Americans know this poem and song and entire other segments do not. Not just the lyrics and the, the stanzas, but the history that is underpinning it. Because as I'm going to ar- endeavor to articulate, this was a great opportunity to move forward in our nation using an historical occurrence and benchmark and using giants of American history to portend to where we could go forward in this country. Let me tell you what I'm, what I'm talking about. So Booker T. Washington, in case anybody doesn't know, he was born a slave. Every single American needs to read his book up from slavery. You need to read his speeches, too. But if you get one thing, up from slavery is a must read. Booker T. Washington was born a slave, but God gave him an insatiable hunger for learning. At 16 years old, at about 16 years old, Booker T. Washington walked over 500 miles to Hampton University. Walked from West Virginia to, to Hampton in the name of the school. It wasn't university. It was, let me get the right name. Mm-mm-mm. Hampton Normal Agricultural Institute. That was the name of the school. When he arrived there, he didn't have the money to enroll, but he had a work ethic that General Samuel Armstrong, one of the principals at the university, said this man needs to be here. Now, this man is 16 years old at the time. Booker T. (laughs) was an amazing student, graduated in three years from Hampton. General Armstrong offered him a teaching job at Hampton University. He ultimately becomes the founder (laughs) of Tuskegee University in Alabama to where he advocated for a method of education that included academic instruction and the cultivation of trades and skills. It was Booker T. Washington's teaching pedagogical methods that led to the establishment of what what became commonly known as Black Wall Street all across the country to where instead of former slaves lamenting their former conditions of slavery, to where they took advantage of the skills that they'd cultivated to start enterprises. And many of them did it. Many of them did it. Booker T. ended up forming what was then called Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, ultimately became known as uh, the Tuskegee Institutes. That's where George Washington Carver ended up going. George Washington Carver ended up uh, teaching Southern farmers how to recultivate their soil because the cotton crops had basically driven the soil mad. So he led the replanting of sweet potatoes that caused the soil to become refertilized. Y'all didn't ask for all of that. But Booker T was coming to visit the Stanton School. James Weldon Johnson as the principal of the school. Think about this. How many times you have a visitor, the principal going to write a poem? The principal of the school says, I have to write a poem to commemorate Booker T's visit and we're celebrating Abraham Lincoln's birthday. That is the context for the poem, guys. Think about this. A former slave and a descendant of slaves meeting together to celebrate having the liberty to educate children in view of the birth date of the 16th president of the United States of America. I don't know a more unifying point in history. Well, I'm saying that tug in cheek. Of course, there are more unifying points. but That's a critical point. And it is with that as the backdrop that James Weldon Johnson says, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. This is a celebration of freedom, but not just freedom in a general sense. Let me keep going. Let it resound. Oh, sorry. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. You got, you got that? Sing a song filled with the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. James Weldon Johnson is writing in 1899, put to music in 1900, about a song filled with hope because of the present. In 1900! Mm-hmm. 
But much of the conversation around this, we never got to the actual text of the, of the song. Nor the context that brought us the poem, which became the song. Facing the rising sun, this is in the second stanza. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. And you know what that sounds like? It sounds like the preamble to our constitution. Where it says in order we have formed this perfect union in order to, to preserve for ourselves and to our posterity a more perfect union. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Stanza three. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening, chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, the past. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed? Have we not come to the place that our ancestors, for all of America, <laughs> have sighed? Stanza four, we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. <laughs> to decry this as divisive is to express a woefully, a woeful and pitiable level of ignorance i'll finish it off i only have two stanzas to go i didn't plan on spending all this time here i have two stanzas to go i want to finish this off so that everybody can understand this is a rich part of our national history and when you look into the, the depth of the text it also is ripe with <laughs> christ-centered god-honoring verbiage but we completely missed all of that because we allowed the rancor of our present polarization to be, dare I say, read into the context of the song instead of allowing the song itself, its lyrics, and the context that it was pinned in to stand out for us, to help us in navigating where we are. We live in an ever-changing culture that continues to fall away from its moral foundations. The AFA Journal provides a Christian perspective on current issues that are important to your family. Produced by the American Family Association, this monthly magazine is full of articles and stories about people who are making a difference in their community and around the world. Sign up today and receive a free six-month subscription. Visit afajournal.org or call 1-800-326-4543. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and One Minute Commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. Let me finish this and then I will move on. So the fifth stanza <clears throat> begins this way. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way. Thou who hast by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path, we pray. Literally, James Weldon Johnson is saying, God who's brought us through a torrential past to this place that our fathers only could dream of, may you keep us in this pathway where we continue forward with the same type of trajectory this common commitment to freedom that we have embraced at this particular juncture. And then this final stanza, which is probably the, the, the biggest reason why I said, man, it was a missed opportunity. Listen to this final stanza. Lest our feet stray from the path, I'm sorry, lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God and true to our native land. James Weldon Johnson is describing the United States of America as his native land. It 
in this moment where this, this, there's this continued effort <laughs> to say, to demonize the United States of America? <laughs> well, we could have pointed to James Weldon Johnson celebrating Abraham Lincoln's birthday in anticipation of Booker T. Washington's visit to his school where he's the principal. He's referring to this as our native land. Now, I want to be I want to be fair. I understand. The concern. That was expressed in saying that. There are two separate national an national anthems, but this is where. <laughs> instruction and context has to be presented. Because James Weldon Johnson never said that. The NAACP made that declaration nearly 20 years after James Weldon Johnson wrote the poem. What I think would have been a more helpful conversation is let's discuss <laughs> the lyrics because here's the thing. We cannot ignore the, the context for things that have arisen. And the reality is, and this is a this is a part, this is a part of our national history that we have to wrestle with. I've heard, and y'all know I use I don't like using the terms using skin shades to de describe people, you know. But the, the very notion of the quote unquote black church exists because you had less melanated people that didn't want to allow more melanated people to worship with them. That, that's just the truth. So what I'm saying is that if we <laughs> focused on the text and the, con the text of the poem and the context of its pinning, there was an opportunity there present to point a way forward for our country. But instead of delving into the substance of the issue and, and re uh, retreating immediately to a polarized, pre-existing condition, we missed an opportunity as a country. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. When I first started reading the, those lyrics, how many people, start, as I was reading them, said, man, this is a divisive poem. Nobody said that. Nobody said that. And what I'm saying is if we could have delved into the substance of the poem and, and delve there and then dialogue from that as the foundation point, we could have had a different conversation. That's what I'm saying. That is what I'm saying. All right. <laughs> David said, Abraham, that last stanza, out a lump in my throat. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Me too. <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing. So if I can say that in a better way or more, in a more simple way, is that a part of the, the way that we have to engage going forward is resisting the temptation to allow everything to be politicized and to be polarized politically. Everything cannot be reduced to R's and D's. It can't be. Now, I know what they want to do. I'm talking about what we do. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, hold up now, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff said it'll help Abe if you sing it. I sang it a little bit on the break, but I ain't going to sing right now. Sometimes I sing. You maybe catch me next time I'm in church. <laughs> Bobby says, tomorrow's intro, we'll sing. We'll see. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Now, man, I didn't intend for that to be that long, but I'm saying that a lot lately. <laughs> now, today, this is amazing to me. And it's like, I can't believe they did this. I can't believe they did this. Today. The, and I think some of us actually started, they started with the, some of the pomp and circumstance yesterday, President Trump's second impeachment trial in the U.S. Senate, which I've explained in great detail <laughs> why, in my view, it's clearly unconstitutional. You know, by reading that thing called the Constitution, you know. But I, I, it, this impeachment trial is happening just as Time Magazine published an article just last Thursday, right before the Senate trial, t 
titled The Secret History of the Shadow Campaign. Now, that's not the whole title. But the beginning of the title of the article is The Secret History of the Shadow Campaign. And I'm going to read a little bit from this article for you. Because Time Magazine published this, and, and Molly Ball was the author, published it on February 4th, said this, that President Trump said, quote, Within days after the election, we witnessed an orchestrated effort to anoint the winner, even while many key states were still being counted. Molly Ball says, in a way, Trump was right. There was a conspiracy unfolding behind the scenes, one that both curtailed the protests and coordinated the resistance from CEOs. Both surprises were the result of an informal alliance between left-wing activists and business titans. End quote. So I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. So President Trump's whole deal was that there were some regressive left-wing activists working behind the scenes, <laughs> working behind the scenes to crown Sleepy Joe, no matter what the American people said. And then Time Magazine puts the article, I mean, this joint is long, 25 pages long, explaining exactly what they did. And, you know, in true regressive fashion, in true regressive fashion, I want to get the exact quote. They basically said, um, we have got to tell this story. We have got to, we, we, we have got to explain what we did. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> like, wow. They put this in print. Now, let me give you the rest of the title, because, of course, they don't present themselves as lying cheaters. They present themselves as the heroes that saved the 2020 election. The full title is The Secret History of the Shadow Campaign That Saved the 2020 Election. Shadow Campaign. <laughs> I mean, this... Guys, this is remarkable. This is, I'm looking for this specific quote. I'll find it. I have others I want get, to get for you. They basically said, oh, we did such a great job at this. We can't, we can't let it go down without people knowing what we did. So in the process of this article, Molly Ball writes, Let me see how, where, where I want to start this. Molly Ball explains that the, 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 the central nervous system of this coordinated effort to basically pull the rug from underneath President Trump started in the home of, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Podhorzer, P-O-D-H-O-Z-E-R. Oh, yeah, they name names. Podhorzer. Mike Podhoser, the senior advisor to the president of the AFL-CIO. <laughs> she explains, quote, in his apartment in the D.C. suburbs, Podhoser began working from his laptop at his kitchen table, holding back-to-back -back Zoom meetings for hours a day with his network of contacts across the progressive universe, the labor movement, the institutional left, like Planned Parenthood and Greenpeace, Resistance groups like Indivisible and Move On, progressive data geeks and strategists, representatives of donors and foundations, state-level grassroots organizers, racial justice activists, and others. She goes even further, quote, Podhoser was hosting these two-and-a-half-hour Zoom meetings with other participants in the project. They pushed Congress, here, listen up, guys, they pushed Congress to fund Vote by Mail and persuaded C Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg to contribute hundreds of millions of dollars to election administration funding. Election administration funding. Translation, Democrat get out the vote effort. Molly Ball didn't say explains that the campaign also used legal efforts to change voting procedures during the COVID pandemic leading to a revolution in mail-in voting. 
Then Molly, Powell, Molly Ball braggingly states, only a quarter of voters cast their ballots the traditional way in person on election day. B bragging. <laughs> bragging. She then <laughs> went on to explain how this cadre of regressive acolytes worked together and she described it as a cabal. Not, I'm not, she said it was a cabal. Miriam Webster, just on the interwebs, defines a cabal as, quote, the contrived schemes of a group of persons secretly united in a plot as to overturn a government. Yeah. She described it as a cabal, a left-wing cabal. She then goes on to, to celebrate that, quote, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce set aside old disputes to join the AFL-CIO in creating an alliance to reject claims of election fraud. <laughs> there was a nationwide left-wing movement to unleash more unrest if Trump claimed victory. And you got to get this in a close election. But Molly Ball explains that Mike Podhoser, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name, said when it looked like they might get the upper hand in the election, that he from his D.C. apartment sent out the word to tell the anarchists to stand down. Now, don't you remember election day? People were preparing for massive unrest. There was a wall built around the White House. And then as I don't even know if I can call it a vote. As the numbers started coming in, all of a sudden there was no, no protest. And people thought, huh, well, how did that happen? It's almost as if it's coordinated. Molly Ball admits that it was. But they want to they wanna try Trump on impeachment this week, though. <laughs> Molly Ball even explains how Mike Podhoser coordinated messaging to national media outlets as to what to anticipate as the vote tallies came in. And you know what told them that their messaging efforts worked? When Fox News called Arizona for Joe Biden before anybody else did. I mean, she bragged about the media coordination. Let me see if I can give you a quote while this disrespectful music is on. Here we go. Quote, Podhurser, meanwhile, was warning everyone he knew that polls were underestimating Trump's support. The data he shared with media organizations who would be calling the election was tremendously useful to understand what was happening as the votes rolled in. So this dude had access to media organizations sending them info. Guys, I'm not even hitting the, the I'm skimming the surface so far. This thing is so deep. And they put it all in print. Now, they cast it as we sa we're saviors of the 2020 election. But the reality is they're revealing their own fingerprints on undermining our voting process. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio.